magnesium. Without this essential mineral, your body can't regulate its hormones. Your blood pressure goes up, your bones weaken, and your muscles cramp and spasm. We're gonna do a deep dive today into everything you need to know about magnesium, including what lab tests to ask your doctor for, which supplements are best, and which forms of magnesium are best, but even more importantly, how you can develop deficiencies in this very critical essential mineral. We'll be right back with all the details. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to Dr. Osborne's Zone. Today we're talking about magnesium. Everything you need to know to make sure you don't develop a deficiency. We're gonna talk about drugs that deplete magnesium. So if you're taking certain medications, you're gonna to wanna to have this information. But we're also gonna be doing a deep dive into blood tests as well as symptoms and diseases linked to magnesium. So stay with me to the very end as we navigate this very critical mineral that your body cannot function without. So let's dive in. Magnesium, what is it? Well, it's a mineral. It's an essential mineral. You get it from eating food. Any nutrient that's essential means your body needs it, can't function without it, and you have to eat it because you cannot produce it. Your body can't take other minerals, other vitamins, carbs, fats, or proteins and make magnesium. You have to eat it. Hence the term essential. Now, that being said, what does magnesium do and why is it important? Well, what we know is at least 700 functions. That's a lot of functions and there are textbooks written on this topic. What we're gonna try to do in this class is simplify it and compress it into applicable information that you can take home and start using right away in your own life to help support your health. Now functions, some of the big functions of magnesium are hormone regulation. We've got sex hormones, and you know, what do we mean by that? Estrogen is a sex hormone. Progesterone is a sex hormone. You need magnesium for these to metabolize them. You need it for thyroid hormone and thyroid stimulating hormones. So a lot of people have been diagnosed with low thyroid and their doctors don't even bother looking at their magnesium levels as a source or a reason as to why that's happening. We need magnesium for the production of insulin as well as the production of cortisol. Now why are these important? Because insulin regulates blood sugar and without it we're, you know, we're going to be more prone to, well, type 1 diabetes, for example, is a disease where our cells lose the ability to produce insulin. Uh, and so again, that diabetes is, is a consequence of that. Well, not having the capacity to make efficient insulin through magnesium deficiency can also contribute to diabetes and poor ability to generate energy from carbohydrates as a food source. Then we have cortisol. Cortisol is our body's natural fire truck, right? It, it puts out fires. It's an anti-inflammatory stress hormone. We make cortisol to fight inflammation. We also make cortisol to wake up in the morning. Cortisol spikes in the morning when the sunlight comes through the window and hits your eyes. Cortisol spikes and it wakes up your brain. So very important hormone in our circadian rhythm and magnesium regulates its production. And we also know that magnesium regulates the nervous system and brain chemistry. Uh, magnesium is an electrolyte. It's oftentimes not referred to when we talk about other electrolytes like sodium and potassium and chloride, but it's very much an electrolyte and through those actions regulates how nerves communicate to other nerves and how brain cells communicate to each other. It also regulates energy production. When we're talking about generating energy, the body's source of energy, oftentimes referred to as ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is produced as a result of the breakdown of carbs, fats, and proteins. And in the, in the modern diets today, most people are way too high in their carbohydrate consumption. 
you need magnesium for that. In essence, there are steps in chemically in how we break down carbohydrates in, in this process inside of our cells called Krebs cycle. Uh, and magnesium is required in multiple steps of that carbohydrate breakdown. And so we cannot generate energy from carbohydrate based foods without magnesium being present. We also know it regulates muscle tone. And this is one of the reasons why cramps and spasms are common side effects. If you've ever had an eye twitch and like an eyelid, this is very commonly caused by magnesium deficiency. Remember that muscle in your eyelid, it, I mean that, that it is a muscle. So again, magnesium regulating that contractility and relaxability. Magnesium is necessary for DNA and RNA production in big part through this process of methylation. Now methylation does more than uh, leading to DNA and RNA, RNA production, which by the way is important because this is how we heal and repair and rebuild new tissue. And so without it, we, we get uh, stuck. We can be injured and have a hard time healing. Our bodies don't repair as efficiently or as, as, as readily. Now methylation, let's skip cell membrane for a minute. Methylation, a lot of people think about methylation and they think about detox. Um, and so detoxification of certain chemicals, we, we detoxify certain types of estrogens through the process of methylation, but the number of chemicals are methylated within the body and it's a form, uh, you know, in a sense, it's the way we, we detoxify and, and magnesium drives this enzyme of methylation called COMT, so if you've ever, uh, gone to a doctor and had your COMT gene measured, magnesium is behind that mechanism. Cell membrane protection. Magnesium is very, very critical for driving systems that help protect the outer layer, the, the fatty layer, the lipid layer of the cell membrane itself. And then of course, magnesium activates vitamin D. So many people taking high doses of vitamin D, oftentimes if, if you're not getting enough magnesium, that vitamin D you're taking isn't gonna work. And I've seen this be the case where people had negative consequences or negative side effects where they were taking vitamin D in higher doses and they didn't feel well. A lot of times it's because of magnesium deficiency. So very, very important functions. Again, we're not gonna get into all 700, but I think it's important that you know some of the big ones. Now, let's take a look at magnesium absorption. Um, the RDA for magnesium is about 400 milligrams, and that's again magnesium coming from food that you eat. So this chart you can see is just it's taken from a, a, a published study, and it's just a summary of of kind of where magnesium goes and which tissues it's highest in. And what I wanted to really focus on showing you here is where do we store, where do we have the most magnesium? We have the most magnesium in the muscle tissue, 6,600 milligrams as well as in the bone tissue, 12,900 milligrams. So muscle and bone are the biggest storehouses for magnesium, and that's important to know as we, as we begin discussing some of the symptoms and diseases associated with magnesium deficiency. It's also important to understand that the kidneys, obviously the GI tract regulates absorption of magnesium, so if there's inflammation in the gut, this process is going to be hindered. It's not gonna happen as efficiently. We also know that kidney damage, okay, can lead to abnormal reuptake of magnesium because some magnesium is lost through the urine, but the kidney is really, really good at recycling and reabsorbing magnesium as it comes through it. So if we've got a disease, a kidney damage or kidney disease, this is also gonna influence or affect our magnesium status. So again, inflammation in either of these two organs is gonna impact how we maintain our magnesium storehouse. Now, let's talk about some of the symptoms, the very common symptoms of magnesium deficiency. And some of these um, are very common, are quite common. So depression, you know, we live in a society today where depression is actually you know, I would say it's epidemic in proportion. People are not happy. Magnesium deficiency can cause or contribute to depression through multiple mechanisms. Well, one of the ways is that you need magnesium for proper production of serotonin and dopamine. So neurochemical production, neurochemicals of happiness, right? 
are necessary. Magnesium is necessary to produce those chemicals. As we said earlier, magnesium also allows for the communication of nerve cells with each other and depressed communication will lead to depression as a symptom. Extreme PMS symptoms. So ladies, if you have severe cycles or periods with lots of anxiety or depression or mood swings or severe sugar cravings, these are symptoms that can be caused when you're going through your cycle of a magnesium deficiency. And I've seen uh, cases where um, women, you know, one week, if this is you, one week before your cycle, you know, four to 600 milligrams of extra supplemental magnesium a day may help you navigate your cycle more effectively with less problems. We also know that magnesium deficiency leads to bone loss. As I showed you a moment ago, the vast majority of our storehouse of magnesium is actually in the bone, but very, very important for the bone matrix. Magnesium deficiency can cause heartburn. It's necessary. Magnesium, understand that it's an electrolyte. And so we get into uh, you know, what electrolytes do. Aside from the electrical conductivity of your nerves, we talk about muscles, right? So as an electrolyte, two muscles, your GI tract is a muscle. People forget that part. They think muscles are muscles, but GI tract actually is a tube that is a muscular tube. If you do not have adequate magnesium, you can get peristaltic problems, you can get reflux-like symptoms, as well as other problems within the GI tract, one being constipation, very common, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of people will take extra magnesium to go to the bathroom. So um, heartburn, constipation, not uncommon at all. Now magnesium also regulates the muscular control of your blood vessels. Remember that blood vessels are also muscles. Your arteries have a muscular layer and those arteries, those muscular layers contract and, re and extend or relax and so magnesium regulates that and this is one of the reasons why low magnesium causes vasoconstriction or a, a tightening of the blood vessels. So if we look at kind of this is the tube of the vessel itself and you have the lining. So you'll have inward contractions and you'll have outward expansions of that blood vessel and without magnesium that can actually narrow, it can constrict, making blood pressure go up. The magnesium is also a natural blood thinner. It prevents platelets from aggregating aggressively. So magnesium itself deficiencies can lead to a greater blood pressure due to thickening of the actual viscosity of the blood. We also have muscle and nerve pains. So aside from spasms, which I mentioned a moment ago, magnesium can, deficiencies can actually also cause pain. Magnesium naturally is an anti-inflammatory. One of the reasons why its deficiency can lead to muscle and nerve pain. And then IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. As I was mentioning a minute ago, the bowel itself, the GI tract is a muscle, right? So if you don't have adequate magnesium, you can just like you can get twitching of your eyelid or twitching in a muscle or cramps, you get cramping of the bowel, which can manifest as IBS-like symptoms. So magnesium, very important in that regard. Then we have fatigue. As I mentioned earlier, you need magnesium to generate ATP, that energy from carbohydrate and, and from fat. So um, when you can't make enough ATP, fatigue is a common outcome. Poor flexibility. Again, this goes back to muscles. If your muscles are tight, if you can't bend over and touch your toes, if your muscles are chronically cramping and tight and stiff, you might have a magnesium deficiency. If you're unable to handle stress, remember I said earlier, one of its many functions is in hormone production, and this includes the production of cortisol, but also includes the production of one of the stress hormones, DHEA, as well as adrenaline. You can't make these hormones, these neurotransmitters and hormones without magnesium. And these are the big ones that help you cope and adapt to stress. So we need magnesium to produce them. So very common symptoms of magnesium deficiency. Getting beyond symptoms are actually disease states that are also linked to magnesium deficiency. 
And uh, we'll get into some of the irony of, of this in a moment. But um, so looking at heart, the heart in the vascular system, we've got high blood pressure, cardiac arrhythmia. So if you've ever gone and had an EKG done and you had abnormal EKG results and your doctor never measured your magnesium level and told you instead he wanted to put you on certain kinds of medications, um, you know, ask him about magnesium. Uh, mitral valve prolapse, heart attacks and stroke linked to magnesium deficiency. Tetany of the muscles or cramping or spasms. Osteoporosis can be caused by magnesium deficiency. Endocrine disorders like diabetes, hypothyroidism, and sex hormone deficiencies. Ladies, how many times have you been to the doctor and they measured your hormones and wanted to put you on hormones? And this is, you know, this is one of those situations where, okay, most of the time, hormone deficiency prompts prescription drugs, right? So low hormone equals prescription, right? How many times have any of you, like if you're listening to this and you went to your doctor and they said you have low hormones, how many times did your doctor measure your magnesium? How many of you can say your doctor measured your magnesium? Or, how may, or, or on the flip side of that, how many of, how many of you have had your doctor just say your hormones are low, therefore you need to take these hormones prescription? Um, you know, that's, that's the sad part about it is you can't make these hormones without magnesium. So if your hormones are low, the bigger question is why are your hormones low? And if you're just jumping toward taking hormones without understanding the biochemistry of how your hormones are produced in the first place, then you could be going on the path of long-term medication use. And one of the ironies of, of, this is especially true of estrogen, is synthetic estrogen prescriptions and even biological repl hormone replacement therapy, estrogens can deplete magnesium, right? So the irony is if your hormones are low because you don't have enough magnesium and then you get put on hormones at higher doses, now you're driving your magnesium down even further. You're now you're stuck in this potentially vicious cycle. But even beyond the vicious cycle, as that hormone is depleting magnesium, it opens you up to all these other symptom and disease possibilities that could also begin to manifest as a result of something called a drug-induced nutritional deficiency. So before you just jump to taking hormones, it's important to understand the, the need of nutrients and the production of them. And this is true of thyroid hormones, this is true of insulin for diabetics, this is true of every hormone. All the hormones in your body are not just these magical ingredients that your body whips up out of thin air. These are very particular substances that need vitamins and minerals and carbohydrates, proteins, and fats in order to properly produce them. So generally speaking, when you're low in a hormone, you've got to go backward. Instead of taking hormones, you need to start looking at vitamins and minerals as potential reasons as to why you're low in it in the first place. And when you come over here, we've got neurological symptoms. We mentioned depression earlier, but migraine headaches. If you're a migraine sufferer and you've been suffering from migraines, and it's interesting because a lot of people with migraine headaches, women, I should say, also deal with PMS. And sometimes it's the PMS, the premenstrual issue, that actually triggers the migraine. And this is a very common uh, kind of duality with magnesium deficiency. And then neuropathies, numbness and tingling and enhanced pain. This is very common peripherally in the hands and the feet. Um, so if you've got neuropathy, think potential for magnesium. And then as I mentioned earlier, constipation, IBS. So again, your GI tract is a muscle that contracts and relaxes. Magnesium plays a role in how well it can do that. And so low magnesium can actually contribute to that irritable bowel. So a lot of different problems that magnesium can create. Magnesium, I should say magnesium deficiency. Now let's ask a deeper question, okay? If you have magnesium deficiency, why? What is the reason, what is the root cause of what drives magnesium deficiency? So we've got certain things, sugar, and this is really not just sugar, but it's, it's um, refined, high refined carbs. And, and, and so it doesn't even have to just be refined carbohydrates, it can actually be just be too many carbohydrates in the diet. We also have stress. Remember I said earlier that you need magnesium to produce stress hormones? 
Well, the more stress you have, the more stress hormones you produce, the more magnesium you use in that production. And this is one of the reasons why magnesium is depleted under high stress. It's also, you know, the kidneys don't reabsorb magnesium under as well, I should say they do, but not as well. Reabsorption through the kidneys is diminished during high states of stress. And then we have coffee and caffeine. Now, I'm not talking, you know, there's some research that shows that like one cup a day actually provides a, a number of benefits, including a longevity. We believe the longevity, a life expansion benefit. But so I'm not talking about kind of moderate to, to normal, what I call normal coffee use, but this is high doses of caffeine. In my experience, when people go over 150 milligrams of caffeine a day, this is where they really start running into symptoms and problems. And so, you know, an average cup of coffee is about 120 milligrams. So if that gives you an idea, I get people all the time that come into my practice and they're drinking, you know, a pot of coffee every day. Their muscles are chronically stiff. They're in a lot of pain. They've got reflux uh, because that caffeine is just basically it's just it's just driving them into into all those symptoms. So careful on quantitative dosing and remember other sources of caffeine beyond coffee or chocolate uh, which is a source in tea so if maybe you don't drink a lot of coffee but you eat a lot of chocolate or you drink a ton of tea this is still caffeine exposure some of you are using diet and weight loss pills that contain coffee extract or green coffee or green tea extracts that also have caffeine in them um, some of you drink energy drinks right and that could fall within this category as well so be careful and then we have medications, and we're gonna get into that in a minute. We're gonna talk about all the different classes and types of medications that we know can contribute to magnesium deficiency as well as gut inflammation. So remember, when your gut's inflamed, this is especially true of those of you with gluten-induced GI inflammation. The gluten we know can cause you know, celiac disease for one, but other forms of gastrointestinal inflammation are common with gluten exposure. And so we know when that gluten damages the gut and the gut lining, it will reduce our capacity or ability to absorb nutrients, including magnesium. Now, let's look at some of the common medications, classes of medications, if you will, that we know can deplete magnesium. So if you're taking any of these drugs, you know, you might talk with your doctor about magnesium supplementation to offset the drug-induced nutritional deficiency. So, or you might reconsider why you're on the medicine in the first place and take dietary and lifestyle strategies to help you get off of the medicine. That would, in my opinion, be even a better option. But this first group is anti-diabetic medication. So there's insulin. So those of you that are on insulin, and the irony here is, you know, if you're type one diabetic, don't stop your insulin. But if you're a type 2 diabetic that's insulin dependent because you've abused yourself through lack of activity and through poor diet choices for years, uh, and a lot of doctors put patients, type 2 diabetics, on insulin when they have failed to do the, to control their diet and lifestyle well, understand that insulin and insulin mimetics deplete magnesium. Um, what are the mimetic drugs? So common ones are like Genuvia. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're on Genuvia, another one, another really common prescription is Genumet. Uh, those medications deplete magnesium. So important to understand that. You're going to understand more in just a minute why as I show you kind of those consequences. Antimicrobials or antibiotics, right? So antibiotics, um, there are a number of different classes of antibiotics that can strip away magnesium. Um, through either through loss in the gut or through loss in the actual kidneys because of the, the kidney damage and the kidney toxicity of some of these medications. But so not just antibiotics, but you can also see antifungals like amphotericin can deplete magnesium. Antiviral medications can deplete magnesium as well. So if you're taking antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral, you might also consider supplementing with magnesium during the time frame of taking that. Other drugs like beta adrenergic agonists um, and bisphosphonates. Let's talk about this. So bisphosphonate is one of the most common drugs prescribed for osteoporosis. And the irony in that is that 
you know, osteoporosis, what did we say earlier about magnesium? You know, when I showed you magnesium is necessary for the bone. You know, we pass it up. I think we did. Yeah, so coming back to this, right? Osteoporosis, we need magnesium in the bone, but taking the very drugs to treat the bone loss deplete the magnesium. How are we winning? And this is one of the reasons why research shows over and over and over again that women who are on bisphosphonate medications are actually at higher risk for fractures than women who aren't on those medications. So it's important to make that connection because so many of you are just trusting your doctor and relying that what they're telling you and what they're doing with you is the right thing. But you've got to be aware, those cl a class of medication causes magnesium loss. Cardiac drugs, so digoxin, if you've ever taken uh, digoxin, this drug depletes magnesium. Diuretics, which are also very common drugs for the heart. They, they lower blood pressure, right? So if you've got fluid retention in your lower extremities, uh, sometimes doctors put you on a diuretic. If your blood pressure is high, sometimes they'll put you on a diuretic. And it's both thiazide diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide is re as ready or as well as loop diuretics like furosemide, uh, both used um, very commonly and cause magnesium loss. Now there are other drugs beyond diuretics and, and, uh, and cardiac glycosides, other blood pressure drugs like ACE inhibitors that also deplete magnesium, not on this chart, but, but that can also do it. So many of your blood pressure medications will deplete magnesium. And of course the irony there is that magnesium regulates blood pressure and magnesium deficiency can cause high blood pressure. So again, if you're taking a drug to lower your blood pressure, the drug causes a magnesium deficiency. What happens when your magnesium is low? Your blood pressure goes up. Again, can you see the irony? And then other types of medications, immunosuppressants um, and EGFR inhibitors, these classes of medications, so if you're taking these, uh, there's also another type of medicine that um, I think I, I should put up here because a lot of women post-surgical, or not post-surgical, but post-cancer, uh, are taking what are called SERMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators, um, and these drugs are commonly given for up to five years after a breast cancer treatment, but these drugs also deplete um, magnesium, and tamoxifen is probably one of the more common that gets prescribed in this situation. So if you're on that medication, you might consider, again, talk with your doctor about the potential need for um, for using magnesium in, in addition or, uh, you know, again, just arm yourself with that knowledge so that you're not doing the wrong thing and leading to, you know, a major problem. So this diagram, let's blow up on this diagram here. Um, so kind of summarizing a lot of what I was just saying, but we're going to put some things into this that help you understand kind of the revolving door of problems that are created when you have a problem and you use a medicine and the medicine depletes the magnesium, recreating the very problem that the drug was intending to treat. And so again, if we look at, at these top three, these are just general causes of magnesium deficiency, as we said, high refined carbohydrate diet, high levels of stress, diuretics, and that includes alcohol, caffeine, and hypertension, medications. The thing that's not on this particular diagram that we mentioned a moment ago is GI inflammation. So if you have, you know, food allergy or a food sensitivity, including something like gluten, um, now, again, we're causing damage and malabsorption, which can lead to a reduction of serum and cellular magnesium levels. Now, when that happens, we, we want to look at this. See these, these in blue. So these are the consequences of depleting your magnesium. These are just some of the really super common consequences of magnesium depletion. So let's we'll start from this side. So number one, depression, right? So we talked about magnesium deficiency causing depression. Well, a lot of times when people are depressed, they go to their psychiatrist or they go to their regular doctor and the medicines that they're put on 
are these SSRIs. And sometimes I've even seen people with depression get put on, on drugs, the, the stimulant drugs, so central nervous system stimulants like Ritalin or Adderall. And um, because you know depression is more than I'm sad, depression can also be I'm brain foggy, I can't think clearly, I can't focus or concentrate. And it's important to know that you know once you start that road, um, if, especially if you're taking a central nervous system stimulator, these drugs actually can lower magnesium as well. So you can get, again, this class of medication, actually it'd be better if I just drew an arrow back up here, actually also leads to the depletion of magnesium. So again, the very nutrient that causes the symptom leads to the prescription of the drug that then causes a deficiency of the very nutrient. And so we get stuck, stuck in that cycle. Vasoconstriction is a side effect of magnesium deficiency and this, the disease state of vasoconstriction oftentimes uh, manifests as high blood pressure or hypertension. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the common thing to do in medicine is to give a diuretic or an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker or, or many of the, there are many different types of blood pressure lowering drugs and of course these drugs have an effect on magnesium, they deplete it as well. So again, we get stuck in that loop. Bone mineralization, as I mentioned earlier, there was HRT, which we said estrogen, so if you're taking estrogen, um, we can write that in here, but also it's not just that, right? It's the bone building drugs. They're what they call bone building drugs and really what they are is they're drugs that make your bone look more dense when you run an x-ray through it, but they don't improve the quality of your bone. And these, you know, again, are the bisphosphonates. So things like Fos Fosamax. And so these medications deplete magnesium and so the very disease that can be caused by magnesium deficit uh, is being reinforced uh, by using medicines that further deteriorate magnesium levels. And then we get muscle spasms and muscle pain were oftentimes given non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and the problem with taking NSAIDs, we draw us another arrow up to here is that they cause GI inflammation. So remember, NSAIDs damage the mucosal layer of the stomach, even at low doses, if they're taken regularly. Aspirin also an NSAID, so we could, we could put an arrow to the aspirin there as well. Um, but they damage that lining and they cause anemia, uh, gastric bleeding, occult blood loss, they cause folate and vitamin C deficiency, and those deficiencies can increase pain in many people um, for several different reasons. But again, the drug being used to treat the symptom caused by the nutrient deficiency is enhancing the nutrient deficiency that caused the symptom. And so you, you get stuck, you get stuck. It's a vicious cycle and it's a dependency cycle, right? So you become dependent in order to function, you become dependent on chemicals that artificially manipulate how your body feels, but these very same chemicals are recreating the problem, thus keeping you stuck. Again, platelet aggregation, which would be your blood's too thick, you've had a stroke or a heart attack, doctors want to give baby aspirin is a very common a uh, very common prescription, and then increases in blood lipids. What do doctors love to do with blood lipids? They love to prescribe cholesterol-lowering drugs, and some cholesterol-lowering drugs, not statins so much, although statins can deplete CoQ10, and CoQ10 deficiency can cause high blood pressure, thus making that problem worth, worse. Um, other types of cholesterol drugs deplete magnesium, and so, and so now, again, we're recreating that, that problem in the same way as we are with all these other different types of medications. So you don't wanna get stuck in this loop, in this vicious cycle or trap. And the problem today with so many people is, and, and if you look at this, okay, we just take our elderly population. The vast majority of people over the age of 45 are on five or more medications. The, the most of them are on cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, so diabetic medication, as well as bone, what, what they call bone building. I, I disagree. I think you're 
you're fooling yourself if you think those drugs are building your bone, but you look at some of the most common prescribed drugs, and, and we, we have now, we have a person who's not just on one of these different potential issues, but they're on all of them. They're on all of these medications, and so now, what kind of synergism are we creating? What kind of effect is this going to lead to over long periods of use and long periods of time on the nutritional status? And this, this, this condition, if you will, or this state is oftentimes referred to as polypharmacy. And why is this dangerous? Because for one, when we combine medicines, we have no idea of the interaction. There is no study, no research that shows that the combination of all these different drugs don't have a synergistic negative impact or effect. There's no, because when drug studies are published and they're, and they're done, they're done where people have one disease and they're only taking one medication. So any doctor that tells you that it's okay, that there are no interactions to worry about uh, because uh, they're wrong because there's no research that indicates. No one's ever studied polypharmacy in this way where we've looked at drugs, multiple drugs in, in a patient as creating an, inter an interaction. But there is a law in biochemistry called the law of, of, of synergism, which is when you start combining different chemicals, you can actually get enhanced effects or worse interactions or, or, or greater kidney or liver damage because many of these drugs have to be metabolized either by one of those two organs. And so you start adding them up and then you look at the complications associated with the diseases already that these people are being treated for and you end up with mass side effects. And then what do doctors typically do? What is a side effect? So I mean, what is a side effect? In essence, it's a symptom. And what doctors do with symptoms is they treat them. That's what our medical system is. It is a treatment model based on here's the medicine to mask your symptoms so that you don't feel bad. And, and so you get stuck even more. And this is why this number just keeps going up. The older somebody gets, typically the more medicines they're on. I mean, I've had patients that have come to see me that were on you know, 20 plus medicines, which in my opinion is malpractice. I don't think anybody should ever be put on that many drugs without being very, very tightly monitored. And these people were just thrown to the wind. They had five, six, seven different doctors, you know, three meds from that one, three meds from that one. Nobody was communicating with each other and people are a mess because in, in large part, many of these medicines reduce or deplete magnesium and magnesium is so important. Remember there's 700 functions for this nutrient that are now being suppressed, right? And if these functions match that patient's symptoms, but the doctor never tests, there is no test being done, no tests for magnesium deficiency then and then the patient sometimes they'll even ask and the doctor says oh that's not magnesium deficiency you don't know what you're talking about but it, but they refuse to do a test and one of the reasons they refuse to do tests is because guess what guess who gets to make your decision not so much your doctor but it's your insurance company and if you're on medicare uh, you know or governmental insurance they really don't like to pay for nutrition at all it's one of the reasons early on in my practice i dropped all insurance plans uh, because I was not going to allow insurance companies to dictate the quality of care that I was able to give. Okay, let's move on to some solutions in food, right? So let's, how do we get more magnesium into the diet? Well, a lot of foods contain magnesium. By no means is this a comprehensive list, but these foods are all very, very high in magnesium. So bang for buck, these are great sources to get your magnesium. Number one, green leafies. And there's spinach, kale, chard, other greens, very rich in magnesium, very great choices if you do well with greens. Now, some of you don't do well with greens because you have an oxalate problem, you know, so that wouldn't be a great choice if you have oxalate issues. But if you don't have oxalate issues, green leafies are a great choice. Wild caught cold water fish. This is a great choice as well. Um, you just want to make sure again, keyword here, wild caught. Don't go buy the farm raised nonsense. The stuff they call sustainable, that farm raised stuff is being fed genetically modified corn and soy. 
So there's glyphosate residue that you have to worry about, but also uh, the, the actual cons consistency of the meat and the nutritional value of the meat is very different when those fish are caught in, um, in captivity. And then meats, and this could be beef, this could be chicken, this could be poultry. Meat contains magnesium. Remember, w just like animals, humans store, the second largest storehouse of magnesium is in muscle tissue. So meats are a great way to get magnesium. Almonds, rich in magnesium. Figs, cocoa, again, what you gotta worry about here, caffeine. So if you're having if you're having problems with caffeine or getting too much caffeine, I don't I don't want you to think, oh, I'm just going to eat tons of cocoa to get all my magnesium because then you create that caffeine diuresis effect causing a loss of magnesium. But reasonably um, eating some cocoa in the diet will get you some magnesium. This is one of the reasons why a lot of women around their cycles crave chocolate. It's really what they're asking is is for more magnesium. And then garlic is a great source as well as pumpkin seeds, fantastic sources, dietary sources of magnesium. So whether you're vegan, vegetarian, or carnivore, or somewhere in between, you've got a way to get magnesium in your diet. Now, let's talk about some of the supplemental forms of magnesium. And so there's a lot of different ones. This is by no means the all end, be all comprehensive list of all the different types, but these are just some of the, the different types I wanna talk about. So these, ones here, citrate, malate, glycinate, and gluconate. These are all good sources. If you're looking at a supplement, these are all pretty good sources of magnesium. What's less effective, or, or I should say less bioavailable and is absorbed at much lower rates, magnesium chloride and magnesium oxide. And it's not that you can't use them. I, I say avoid it, but it's not necessarily that I'm saying you have to avoid it. It's just that pound for pound, the absorption of, of chloride and oxide are very, very poor. So you don't get, so if you're trying to take 200 milligrams of magnesium oxide, you don't get great absorption from it. So in, in a big way, you're losing out on how much you think you're getting because your body is less capable of absorbing it. And then over here, there's magnesium three and eight. And this one I put up here because it's very unique in its property. Three and eight is the carrier. Um, and so what it does is it helps magnesium get through the blood brain barrier. So it gets magnesium to your brain. And why would this be helpful? Well, if you struggle with sleep, magnesium can help support a good night's sleep. So magnesium three and eight can really help those of you maybe who have some insomnia or maybe just have a difficult time falling asleep at night, this is a really great kind of magnesium to aid uh, and to support your sleep. Now, additionally, there, and there are a number of animal studies. I don't think we've seen great human studies yet, but there are a lot of animal studies on magnesium 3 and 8 for dementia, meaning it improves neurological function in animals and helps to improve the symptoms that they're experiencing of dementia. So three and eight, because it can get past the blood brain barrier, just a unique type of magnesium uh, in that regard. And if you're looking, you know, for any of these, we, we you know, gluten-free society, we have different versions of magnesium for different reasons. You can check those out. We'll put links, you know, down below in the, in the comments and in the, and in the description section. And then there's also magnesium in the form of Epsom salt. So that's misspelled, that should be M, uh, Epsom salt baths. And so although some would argue that you don't absorb magnesium from an Epsom salt bath, there have been one or two studies that do show absorption can occur. So you can get absorption through your water if you, you, know, if you add enough Epsom salt to it. But there's no great studies that show kind of quantitatively how great that absorption works. But there's tons of anecdote of people using magnesium salt in their bath water and coming out of their bath water where their cramps are gone and their muscles are more relaxed and they're more ready for sleep. And of course, hot water can have an impact on those things as well. So is it the hot water or is it the magnesium? I would say it's probably a little bit of both, but it's a good way, in my opinion, if you're trying to get nice and relaxed and get your muscles uh, that are tight and maybe tense and stiff to loosen up, it's a great way to do that. And the magnesium oils 
and lotions. There's, there's not a lot of research here either, but there is a lot of anecdote that I have seen people where they have cramps and so they apply the magnesium oil, for example, on their feet and then their foot stops cramping and then they can get a good peaceful night's sleep. So the, these are just, again, some of the generalized forms of magnesium that you can check out in terms of supplementation. So I always recommend you, you try your best to get it as much as possible from your food before, um, so don't ignore your food in lieu of supplementation. Try to get it through your food as well. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the blood tests. So how do you know whether or not you have a magnesium deficiency? Um, you know, there are different kinds of tests that can be done. Some people use hair tests. Some people use serum magnesium tests. Uh, some people use urine output tests. My opinion, clinically speaking, these are not worth your money. Um, they're not really gonna tell you much about your magnesium. If you really wanna understand your magnesium in a deeper and a more accurate way, there's two types of tests that are better. One is the red blood cell test. And th the good news here is most doctors can order this because it's not like an esoteric specialized lab. Most like your lab core, your Quest labs, these are part of their repertoire of tests that they offer. So you can actually go into your doctor and ask them, hey, I'd like to get a red blood cell magnesium test to just check my levels. And, um, and, and generally speaking, the reference range on, on red blood cell magnesium is anywhere really between, like depending on the lab, so this might change or vary depending on the lab, but like anywhere from like 3.8 to 7 and a half milligrams per deciliter. Um, you know, and you, you definitely wanna be, in my opinion, in that four plus range. It, so if you get your result back and you're not, and you maybe you're on that lower end, you might consider with some magnesium supplementation. The other way to test your magnesium is through lymphocyte proliferation. And this is the way I prefer, um, and there's a reason why lymphocytes have a six month life cycle. So, and red blood cells, by the way, have a three to four month life cycle. And that's why they're, that's why they're a good indicator of, of, of magnesium storage in the body because you're not just looking, so when you look at hair, serum, or urine, uh, more specifically when you're looking at serum and urine, you're looking at, you know, daily, what happened today? What, what was that daily intake or daily excretion? What did it look like? So you're looking at this like um, very, very short, it's a short snapshot based on recent intake, right? Recent meaning within the last day or two. So it's not really a great indicator of long-term magnesium status because you could go in on a day of a test and maybe last night you ate more foods that were richer in magnesium and so you're getting this serum or urine output level that looks pretty normal uh, based on the lab reference ranges. So again, not great for understanding whether or not you have long-term magnesium deficiency, but using lymphocytes or red blood cells, you have this really nice, long, multi-month span with lymphocytes. It's a six-month life cycle. The other thing that's nice about lymphocyte proliferation, in my opinion, is that it's an outcomes test. So it's measuring whether or not your cells are capable of performing their function based on whether or not they have adequate quantities of magnesium storage. So it's not a test that compares you to other people. It's a test that actually looks at the growth of your own cells to see if they're able to grow based on whether or not they have enough magnesium. And so a functional test is always going to be superior to a serum test or a urine test where the values are based on averages of people in the population because at the end of the day, you aren't all the other people that went into creating the reference range. You are you, you are uniquely you. And so using testing that can help you understand uniquely whether or not you're low is gonna give you an advantage over knowing whether or not you need to actually add more magnesium into your diet or supplement with it. So these two tests would be my advice on best choices. So talk to your doctor about those. If they've never heard of this, don't ask them to go 
Well, you could, you could go ask them to figure it out. But my point is if they never heard of it, they're not qualified. And I, you know, I shouldn't really say that. Maybe they're not qualified because uh, doctors can learn. But most of them will, will run the other direction before they go and read and learn about science uh, in this way. But, but Quest and, 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 and LabCorp run this test. It's very, very common. Insurance will cover it. Uh, and so it's worthwhile asking for but again, lymphocyte proliferation, more accurate. If you can get that, definitely get it. If you have a doctor that knows what that is, you've got a really good doctor as it relates to nutrition. Remember, nutrition is, is a field of expertise, right? And so there aren't very many of us that are experts in nutrition. Very few doctors are. The average doctor when they go through school takes less than seven hours of nutritional coursework and that's just not enough to, to be considered an expert. So keep that in mind. So if you've got a doctor who understands this, who's taken tremendous amounts of postgraduate coursework in nutrition and knows what they're doing, you've got a great doctor. Okay, so there is your course on magnesium. Again, don't forget, if we summarize, magnesium plays a role in 700 different functions. One, number two, there are numerous different symptoms and illnesses that magnesium deficiency can cause. Many of these symptoms and illnesses are medicated. Many of the medications used to treat these symptoms and illnesses can cause magnesium deficiency, thus creating a trap for you to be stuck in. Don't get stuck in that trap. Make sure you're getting adequate magnesium and if you're not sure, these are the blood tests that you can have done to check your levels to ensure you're getting adequate quantities. Look, I hope this video was helpful for you. And if it was, I would appreciate you sharing it with people that you love and care about. Remember, our mission here is to save 100 million lives. We're trying to expand and reach more people. And we do that with you. And other ways you can support us, hit that like button if you haven't already. And also, hit that subscribe button if you want to get more great content just like this. And you can also support us by coming to glutenfreesociety.org. That's my hub. And you can check out the thousands of videos and articles and other information that we have there. It's all free for you. And if you're so inclined, support us by purchasing and using our certified gluten-free products of high quality and high caliber. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you in the next show. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this. And make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.